Hi everyone, I'm Victor from Red Badger and we're here with Paul Frazy, um, a co-author of the Beaker browser. Um, a little while ago, I um, wrote a blog about um, all things around peer-to-peer -peer web, which got picked up by VentureBeat, um, caused a bit of a stir on Twitter, and then we started talking, and then eventually we invited you to um, come over to London to, to give a talk. So thanks for coming and welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, what is the Beaker browser? So Beaker is a peer-to-peer -peer web browser. Uh, I started with a um, colleague of mine, Tara Vansel. We put together a company, Blue Link Labs, and we've been working on it for about a year and a half. And uh, so we took Chrome and put it into a new web browser. Right. And uh, yeah, we've been trying out some new technologies and uh, seeing what we can get out of it. Right. So yeah. what, what makes Beaker different from other browsers then? You mentioned it's a peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah, that's right. So uh, you know the way the, the web works, you usually you use a server for everything. Mm -hmm. you know? So you want to make a website, you'll create a server up in the cloud, you'll put a database on it, put all your code up there. And, uh, and so that server ends up kind of running the show. Yeah. And so with Beaker, we're playing around with the idea that maybe we could get rid of servers and just have right. people's computers doing the work. So uh, just go into your browser and say, I'd like to make a new website. And it makes a new address for you. And you can just share and, and, and transact between your computers mm -hmm. instead of having some kind of service being involved at all. And right. um, that way you have a much more kind of personal connection to what's going on. Right. So how, how does that work? And is it just for a browser? Or do, can it do other things as well? Because that seems like a fairly fundamental shift from right. what the web is doing. Right. There's a kind of a, a bunch of different technologies that are involved in this. And it doesn't just have to be the browser. It can be put into uh, um, desktop applications. It can be put into the cloud or mobile, things like that. Um, the main technology we're using is called the DAT protocol. Okay. And it is, uh, it's actually a little bit like BitTorrent. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, it's a, I guess you might call it a cryptographic network where you can use these new tools that make it uh, very easy to create web domains or, or shared folders and things like that and, and share that between computers and, and um, then have other people's devices um, help contribute bandwidth so that everybody's sort of acting together, which is something that BitTorrent actually did maybe 10, 15 years ago. And now what's happening is we're looking at those old ideas and going, okay, we can modernize them a little bit, add a few new tools, and actually it can be pretty mainstream. Right? right. So going past just the old file sharing stuff and instead saying, can we build entire applications off of this sort of BitTorrent idea? And it actually looks like the answer is yes. There's a lot of cool things you can do with it. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so if you compare this peer-to-peer -peer, um, web with the web of today, what's mm. what would be sort of the main difference and advantage of mm. doing this? One of the things I like to focus on is this idea that the web is almost like a little society. Right. And you have two kinds of citizens in your society. You have the server and you have the client. And we're, we're all clients, and but these servers, they have a... a a lot more control over everything. They have these rights to, to do the publishing and they set the code, they moderate everything. Right. And then we're the ones trying to use this stuff, but we're just the clients and we can only just browse around and you know, mm. run an ad blocker maybe, but we don't have a lot of control over how this works. And someone else owns those servers and runs right. the show and sets the rules. Exactly, yeah. So um, if we could get rid of this sort of two-tiered citizenship and make it so that everybody is just one kind of citizen and that's just people's computers. And then the people that are actually using this stuff can actually have a, a say in how the web works. They can change the code. They can see how these algorithms work and decide, you know, maybe I would just like to get a chronological feed. I don't want to have ads being yeah. injected and all that kind of thing, right? Um, or I'd like to know who gets my data, right? And, and whether or not that's being sold to somebody or if it's actually, you know, private it's because I want to. Quite a private. current problem, isn't it? Yeah, right. Cool. Um, so, yeah, if we can make it so that people have a, a better representation in, in the web and, and on these online spaces. That's really where we're trying to get with it. Right. So if um, everyone's sort of equal, mm. then uh, how do you decide what sort of is the, the current truth? Like the, if you know what I mean? Like if yeah. um, we all decide that we will register a Twitter handle mm -hmm. um, called Red Fox, um, how in this environment where there is no central authority, how do you decide which ones? Yeah, that's a, that's a sophisticated uh, question, actually. Uh, you could, 
How, how technical do we want to get for that? Oh, I think we can go fairly technical. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. That's a, a tricky question. How do you deal with um, what you might call canonical yeah. information, yeah. The, the sort of like verbatim truth that everybody's going to go with? Um, Traditionally, when you use a service, you just say the service is the authority. Whatever the service yeah, yeah. says, they're going to set it. So Twitter, for instance, tells you who is who. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're trying to get rid of any s appointed authority, you have to come up with some other way of saying what the truth is. There's two different schools of thought. Um, there's the... Um, I guess there's the service and peer-to-peer -peer hybrid where you say, we'll have a service that will help us with those names, right. but nothing else. We'll use peer-to-peer -peer for everything else, but we will have a, a service, and that service will just tell us the names. So that service is almost just keeping a bunch of pointers for you. Yeah, yeah. And that, that points out to the to the peer-to-peer -peer network, so people are doing most of the work off of the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, but then these services can help you with this hard question of how do you decide you know, the canonical truths. So that's one this idea. is actually similar to how state is maintained in applications. Like that, traditionally you have sort of stateful things all over the place, but right. turns out you can actually pull that all to the side into almost like a single reference that goes, "This is the current state," right. and everything underneath is just data that sort of moves along. Right. So it's quite similar in that sense that mm -hmm. you have a central authority that decides the now, but all of the data just sort of lives in the yeah in the swarm. If you've used, I mean, you know, immutable systems. Like um, Git, for instance, are pretty yeah. comfortable with yeah. that idea. Um, this whole set of of, um, of 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 data, and then we're just moving pointers along that that log or or that blob set. So very much like that. The other um, other common, you know, as I said there's two schools of thought. The second one is to use blockchains, right? And uh, to do that, you have to have some kind of um, what you call a decentralized consensus algorithm, right? Um, the most well known right now is proof of work. Yeah. And it's uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting approach. It's got some performance problems mm. um, and some energy consumption problems. As right, well. right. Yeah. So the efficiency of, of uh, decentralized proof of work is is like if they can't solve that, then it may not work out. Um, but things like proof of stake are being worked on to see if maybe they can figure it out. And actually, uh, with proof of work, they're even in some cases suggesting we use things like lightning networks, which try to move as much as possible off of the the, uh, the blockchain which is sort right. of what we're talking about, right? Just putting the pointers yeah, inside yeah. the blockchain, um, which will you know, possibly help with the uh, efficiency problem. So you know, maybe that'll work. And would you say that this problem is in sort of all of um, applications that you would build in the peer-to-peer -peer space? Or is that more kind of a special thing that not everything needs to solve? It's a, it depends, actually. Um, if you're just publishing uh, media, blog posts or, or videos or things like that, then you don't need to have um, any kind of source of truth. You can just put out a, a sort of a static website on the peer-to-peer -peer network and, and, and you're good. Um, we have a little clone of Twitter that we put together right. that purely peer-to-peer. -peer. Right. What is and it called? Uh, it's called Fritter. Oh, right. Right. little uh, joke. But uh, it's just it was designed to see, like, okay, we have nothing but peer-to-peer -peer right now in our technology stack. We don't have a solution yet for, the, for right. the centralized state. So how do we deal with that? And how far can we go? And um, it's sort of, it's an interesting experiment. Um, you don't have any names. Right. Um, you have URLs, which are these um, cryptographic URLs. Right. And they're 64 character hex strings. Right. right. So not pretty. Probably not easy to remember. No, no. Uh, you can share it. You'll share it over email or something like that, or, or like yeah. you'll chat it. Uh, SMS you something scanning like that. a QR code or something you could do that. someone's phone yeah you could there's, there's interesting things you could do um, hardware maybe that like does a handshake in person things like that yeah. so there's there's interesting ideas for how you could deal with that but without that um, you find some way to share it and then um, and you follow the person and then you, you publish that you follow them and that's another interesting way to find people as you look at who people you follow oh, yeah, right. Like, right kind of explore the network because it becomes this sort of almost web of trust like in PGP or like yeah. I follow you and you follow a bunch of interesting people, so I start following them, and they follow mm -hmm. other people. So yeah, it's actually it's it's like if you turn the PGP web of trust, and you took that and you merged it with like Twitter in a way, right? Yeah, turned it into an application network, and um, it works when you're trying to transact with people that you're connected to, 
that's no problem because you know who they are, you know that they're trying to talk to you, so we have like notifications so that somebody's mentioned you and things like that. That all works fine, but if you're trying to talk to somebody that you don't know yet, that you're not following, that's hard to do because how would you know that they're trying to talk to you? Yeah. If there's no global, well, there's a global network, but it's decentralized. And so that's, that's sort of how far we can get with just the pure peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Right. We can, once you have a good established connection with somebody, that works fine, um, but the, there's still, you know, how do you get notified when somebody you don't follow talks to you, or how do you look somebody up reliably by a short name? That would be nice to have. Yeah. And that's when you need to have some and kind of global you need, state. You need consensus again for that, because yeah. people want the same names, right? Yeah. Um, is the protocol purely designed for a sort of web-like content, or can it do like large volumes of data or streaming media or that yeah. sort of stuff? The, um, the main engineer behind the protocol uh, goes by Mafintosh. Uh, he's been very, very interested in making sure that both what you just talked about, you know, large sets of data uh, and streaming data are pretty big priorities for him. Um, and so you can stream video and audio off of it um, and uh, have actually dynamic data sets so that you can All right. keep appending information to it and that'll sync out as it goes. So uh, important use case. Um, That's a feature in Beaker, isn't it? You can follow a, a page and yeah. it like live updates as it's being edited. Yeah, yeah, we, you know, it was, since we can sit there and listen for updates, we thought why not put live reloading just right into the browser because that's a, a fun thing to have, right? Yeah. So yeah, you can turn that on and... Um, that's it's a good demonstration of what's possible with yes. a different protocol than you're used to, right? Different, different right. than HTTP. Right. So yeah, live, live data is a pretty important part. It's also great for something like um, Fritter because we want to be able to know when somebody posts a new update. So we can just sit right. there and listen. So it's pretty handy. But. Uh, then the uh, lots of lots of data is also really important. There's some new protocol work being done right now, specifically focused on this. And uh, he, uh, Mafintosh, has been taking Wikipedia and dumping it in just one giant folder, all the entries, and millions yeah. of files. And so that's actually um, really important because like, mm -hmm. part of the problem with the current web is sort of like things like link rot and content right. drift, where theoretically, if Wikipedia somehow runs out of money, mm -hmm. uh, we may lose it overnight. Like they turn off the servers and we're done. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the archival question. Um, and that's actually one of the great, it was one of the things that motivated the DAT project um, right. in the first place. Um, they were concerned about scientists, um, you know, academics, and uh, also um, cities that have civic data. And this is you oh know, right, yeah. different sort of measurements and things like that. And they wanted to make sure that you could keep that stuff online even if, for instance, a university they published uh, a paper, you know, they have an admin group that's going to try to keep things online, but eventually those websites pretty frequently go away. Mm. And so how do you let somebody publish something and then not have to worry that the university's IT department is going to stay funded, you know? Um, and so the answer to that is this sort of BitTorrent style of, of network, because the address is not connected to any one computer. It's this yeah. public key, and it's you know you can use actually use DNS with it, so you and can it's linked to the content itself, right? So you're you're sure that that address will only ever point to that particular piece of content and not a different one underneath. So there's two kinds of ways that these distributed file systems are designed, and, and the DAP protocol is a distributed file system. Um, so there are two main approaches. There's what you call the content hash addressing, and the public key addressing. Right. So a content hash address is. Um, you create a hash of the content, creates a unique number that like and get, like and get exactly, yeah. specifically references that file, and so it's actually very static. Yeah, um, which has a, a nice benefit, which is whenever you look at the file, you can check the hash and make sure that it's the correct information. So as a linking structure on the web, a content hash address is really powerful because it sort of um, captures the content that you're pointing at and makes it so it can't be anything else. Yeah, right. just the same as Git, which is one just of the, like the great features that you like know that that set of characters identifies your, your files and the entire history and it can't right. possibly be anything else. Right, right. Yeah. So that's fantastic for archival. Um, and you can, you can use those sorts of systems, but then the constraint is that it's static. Right? Yeah. So sometimes, in, in fact, I think most of the time you want to be able to change your data over time. That's how we think of websites. Yeah. So as a primary addressing scheme um, with the DAP protocol, we've instead chosen to use public key addressing. And public key addressing is um, where you use create a key pair and use the public key as the URL. 
Yeah. And then you can make changes in what you do. Is It's actually one way to do this is, is to have content hashes and then make the public key a pointer yeah. to the most recent content hash. And, um, and then you sign that pointer with the private key. And so when somebody yeah. receives the content, they can check that signature is correct. And yeah. that, that's, you know, then you they can it's tell right. it's you and not mm -hmm. someone else. Right. Yeah. right. So in the DAP protocol, we're using the public key addressing. And uh, it's actually still quite good for archival. Right. Um, because you can, anybody can, can host the content because it's all um, signed data. So, you know, I can get the files from a data archive from you. I can get it from, you know, my friend down the street. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I can check that signature and be like, yep, yeah, that's, that's correct. And so that's fantastic for archival because um, you can publish it and use the university resources at first. And then over time, some other company can come along or some charity or something like that and say, we need to make sure this data stays online. And they can take over the serving duty right, yeah. for, for some kind of scientific work or, or anything. Really. So if anyone decides that a particular piece of content is sort of socially important and significant, right. they can just take on the, the responsibility for serving and making it available. Right. Rather than relying on a particular person or entity. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And there's some really interesting implications for that when we put that into a web browser, because we can actually uh, sort of automate that process. So oh, right. um, in Beaker, the way it works for the moment um, is when you visit a site, you will actually share those files for a little bit. You'll contribute some bandwidth back. And it's, it's almost sort of altruistic, really. Yeah. Um, because you, you're saying, you know, this is something that I benefited from. I want to help keep it online. I want to help serve it for a little bit. And it helps keep costs low. Yeah. Um, you know, a big part of what we want to be able to do is make publishing um, independent yeah. so that you don't have to rely on really big cloud providers to make a website or, or share a video. Try and pay for it with advertising. Or yeah, exactly. Like right. That. So if we can offset the costs of making a, you know, a website work, then we get much more um, freedom as users to, to not have to worry about the economics. Yeah. And so a big part of that is saying, okay, well, why don't we all help each other out? And if you use something, then contribute a little bit of bandwidth and you know that's that's why you could publish a video from home and then if it goes viral you're not going to get slammed yeah, at home with yeah. every one of those requests. And you can decide how much bandwidth you're willing to to spare exactly on, right. on your home internet. Right? Yeah. Sure. How do you see the adoption of, of these technologies going? Mm. I'm sure you, you, you're thinking about that all the time. Yeah. Yeah you know uh, uh, you have to make it uh, accessible. That, yeah. that's, it's about you know, making sure that you can put it into something where uh, you don't have to be um, technically savvy mm -hmm. to, to really get the benefit from it. That right. to me is the main thing about Beaker is that it's yeah. just a web browser. It's, like really, right. it's the same experience as getting Firefox. You just download yeah. it from the, from the and you start browsing. It does normal internet, right. um, but it also does this new thing. Right, yeah. The, uh, that's exact, you know, in, a, in a way, it's almost like we're just trying to surgically insert these new things and then change as little as possible along the way um, so that it does feel familiar mm -hmm. and, um, and easy to use. And so that's probably the biggest challenge early on is to make sure that the tools are completely um, approachable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you can uh, do that, then from there it's about adding you know, better features and, 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 and more capabilities and things like that. I mean, the main one seems to be the ability to publish a website just mm -hmm. from your browser. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's a new big thing. Yeah. Do you think there's use cases sort of behind the scenes as well for, like, say, big companies that need to serve a lot of data? They would mm -hmm. like, use DAT or, or some of the other protocols within their data centers to, yeah. to synchronize things and that kind of thing to like, reduce costs, maybe. Yeah. So you would sneakily almost um, make make these protocols a, a tool for everyone that is now so prevalent that you would just be there and everyone can pick it up. Kind of like, right. almost like Git, right? Some people mm -hmm. use Git for other things that it was designed for just because everyone's familiar because all the developers use it. Right. Yeah, well, sharing files has always been a pain for everybody. Yeah. Uh, that just continues to be the case. Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of interesting advantages. Uh, the configuration you have to do is really minimal. Mm. You share around the links and then you can start syncing from one device to another. Yeah. That's very handy. Um, the archival we were talking about, even within a company, 
is actually quite handy as well. Yeah, audit trail is like a really typical requirement that yeah. almost everyone has to like, be able to see what content was over mm -hmm. time and who actually contributed and right. who did what. So when someone does something does go wrong, you can at least tell what it was and how to prevent it next time. Right. So that's a big thing. Yeah. yeah. So the audit trail is useful. The uh, the less configuration, you know, easier sharing files between machines. That's great. Um, and then within applications, um, you should be able to see some cost cutting for people that have services already. Because you know this peer-to-peer -peer network, it's almost sort of like a CDN. Yeah. Um, and to some degree, we'll have to find out how much, but to some degree, you can offload your bandwidth costs mm. to the network itself. So yeah, if, if you think of someone like Netflix, right. like who serve what, a quarter of the net network traffic on the internet, right? Um, and they have to serve that all centrally from one place. Mm -hmm. That must be an insane network around that, that data center. Right, right. Um, so they could actually spread that around and they weren't concerned with DRN, which is probably not as easy to solve in right. that situation. Right, right, right. They could really help. So that could be a, a sort of a killer app as well, like some kind of um, video streaming service, which right. doesn't actually rely on a huge infrastructure. So you could think of yeah. YouTube, but not actually controlled by a company. Right. Like an independent sort of um, forum where people could publish video content. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they would still use their service to sort of give the canonical back. Yeah, yeah. Right. But then you offload it as much as possible. But the content itself is like actually not a huge problem. Right. So what you're serving is a fairly small standard web app, which just goes, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's out there somewhere. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they, you get a couple of neat advantages too. You you know you're offloading the hosting to multiple people. In some cases, you may be getting better um, connection times because you'll have co-located people yeah. sharing data. So even like within the same Wi-Fi, if people are looking for the same things, yeah, their yeah. computers might actually just. What I really like is that the, the the hosting capacity scales with the number of users interested in the piece of content. So yeah. it's quite natural. It doesn't. It doesn't have this weird disbalance of I am the one author and now I need mm -hmm. to support millions and millions of people looking at the thing. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, if, if, if you think about it in a way, there's kind of a curse of making a successful web application. Yeah. You know, so you're gonna have to, to support everybody that could ever wanna use it. Because suddenly you can't really spend time working on new features of the app because you need to right. stabilize it for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Right, and that's when the VC comes along and helps you grow your yeah. <laughs> business and everything. And then you give money to Amazon. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So what, what are you working on at the moment in Beaker? Uh, usability, and right. accessibility, right? Making sure that somebody can sit, you know, we, we had a prototype a year and a half ago that did all the basic things, you know, being able to browse the sites, create sites, things like that, that are peer to peer, but um, being able to just sit down and immediately get it, that takes a lot yeah, of work. Yeah, yeah, of course. So we're in that process of making sure that everything is just, um, uh, just super easy right? and, and obvious. And so it, it, that's all the different flows where it's got a little tooltip telling you exactly where to go and you don't yeah, have to yeah. know anything ahead of time. It's just like, oh yeah. The little annoying things that all actually make it great. Right, yeah. right. And takes that takes so much more time than you ever expected to. You know, mm -hmm. just getting that usability yeah, really yeah. good, that's a, that's a hard, hard job. Do you, do you um, have people interested in building apps that are like specifically leveraging DAT and yeah. work in Beaker? Yeah, we have. Um, there's a, a, John Kyle is working on a CMS that's totally built on top of Beaker in the oh right. stack. And it's a, it's a very neat sort of file-based design. It's, it's really cool. He just actually did a live stream talking about it. Um, and he's trying to take that ease of use even further, right? Because as, as the browser, we have to stay a little bit unopinionated. We try to work at just the file level and, and be, you know, good for advanced people. And then uh, he's putting GUIs on top of every step. Right, so that you can very easily, you know, kind of like the WordPress so peer-to-peer -peer. work for everyone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like browser feature-wise, apart from accessibility, do you have anything interesting in planning? Oh yeah, um, it's a lot of uh, the, the pipeline is that uh, Macintosh does protocol work, and then right. we stick it into the browser somehow. Yeah. And so he's doing a lot of uh, really great work, adding in uh, the ability for multiple people to collaborate on a single data archive. Oh, right. That's going to be really important. Um, so you could have sort of Google Docs style yeah. collaborative editing, but peer to peer. Yeah. So that's that's coming along. Um, new uh, new sort of primitives to like uh, there's a key value database, sort of like LevelDB, 
that's being implemented on top All of right. the DAT network. And uh, that's, that's a part of the same actually protocol update. And so we'll be able to give a, a really, uh, hopefully, a really good sort of primary data store. Um, that's awesome. That you can build applications on. Because that makes it way more sort of approachable for, for app developers that mm -hmm. will go like, where do I store things? Or right. just files? Well. Yeah. Yeah. But with you, like you a database that has yeah, an index yeah, yeah. and can search and things that that's massive. Yeah. And he's he's building some really amazing features into this. It can work over the network and do random access reads over the network, no problem. You don't have to download the entire thing ahead of time. Right. So it's very efficient over the network. Um, and that'll have the multi writer as well. And so that's gonna be a fantastic update to the to the stack. And and so that's actually you know, other than getting the usability right, the, the stack of technologies that you need to build all the applications you expect to build on the web is really sort of where the focus is going to be for the next right. five years. So what key things do you think I'm missing then from that sort of stack? Uh, like uh, what, what's missing from the stack? Yeah, now? from like yeah. what stops you from building everything on the internet again on these things? Yeah, uh, well, let's see. I can think of one which is a search engine for, for content hosted on right. on DAT or even IPFS or other places. Right. It's something that actually indexes the public content. Right. So that you can find find it and play with it and see what what, what it does. Mm -hmm. So I guess essentially, I tried Beaker, and the only um, site um, that is served over DAT I know is your homepage. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I looked at that and I was like, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, pulling that from some someone somewhere, no yeah. idea where. But other than that, it's quite difficult to, to find where things are at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, funny thing is there's only a few, a handful of websites already, so we'll probably start with something more like Yahoo, oh, yeah. Google, right? Get a little portal going. Um, Replicate the history of the internet again on start a peer to peer web, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just read the history books and copy everything. Um, yeah, discovery is a, a hard problem still. Um, I guess. If you're looking at how to build applications, you have to start with a way to publish and synchronize data. And that's what the DAT protocol is giving you. And yeah. So then the, um, the key value database is sort of a variation on it, mm -hmm. make it easier for certain use cases. Um, you need to be able to get good um, connections to somebody that's not uh, on the publishing network, but just a synchronous channel. Yeah. And you might be able to use WebRTC for that, but the reliability is a little bit questionable, mm -hmm. so we might just build something of our own for that. Right. Uh, and then you need, um, let's see, you need, a, you need a way to handle canonical state, mm -hmm. like you were talking about. And so we may need to either maybe a blockchain to handle that, or we might end up creating a service layer that's designed to be lightweight. Um, in a way, one of the things that's most important is that you just get away from having um, services that are hard-coded you know, yeah. an endpoint that runs things. And so maybe what we can do is have public key address services. So right. there's still that level of indirection. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with discovery and search, uh, what we need is uh, aggregators. And yeah. that's a whole kind of layer of services that uh, there's some interesting potential with that because you can actually, you know, crawling on the peer to peer network, um, we have a little more information than you do on HTTP. Yeah. Because these data archives actually have a full manifest of all the files that are inside of them, which you don't get on HTTP. Yeah. Um, and so crawlers are a little bit easier to write. Mm -hmm. um, you can list all the files and, and look at specific paths for different kinds of things. And if you publish JSON or once we get this key value store in there, the key value stores are actually kind of websites, but they just, instead of serving files, they have key values. Yeah. So crawling these sorts of networks of, of those sites, it's, it's possible to do it in uh, just your browser by itself um, because you're not parsing HTML and you can pretty quickly pull down a site manifest and say, okay, I'm interested in those little pieces and nothing else. Um, so what we might be able to try to do is get a crawler built into the browser. Oh, right. They can yeah, because you can also take that search index that it builds and, and serve it over that in the same way. So then yeah. the browser itself has access to all of the, yeah. the search index. So yeah. It doesn't even have to talk to a service or fetch much. They to uh, actually do a search. That key value store we're talking about, that's one of the things we're looking at. Is just yeah. Maybe you can start to have shares. Right? So you can start to get this kind of uh, distributed search architecture and sharing the computed indexes and have everybody sort of contributing. Yeah, you're slowly it. getting back to the original model of the web, which is mm -hmm. like everyone has a server, it's fine. Right, that's exactly right. Turns out it's not as easy. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, 
Well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank um, you. Looking forward to your talk tonight, uh, which we'll hopefully link in the description somewhere below. Um, and thank you for coming to London to, to speak. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for having me.